tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the jungles of South America and a seething tale of terror and violence as told by James Poe in Bloodbath. Starring Mr. Vincent Price. By portaging the rapids and walking the mules in the shallower stretches, we'd managed to get our supplies and equipment more than 1,700 miles up the river. After this, further navigable passage being impossible, We'd traveled by foot, hacking our way through the thick, steaming jungle, coaxing and goading the heavily laden beasts. We'd left the jungle and begun the climb. Eleven days later, high in the Andes, we found our objective, and we set to work, hard work. And then, on a hazy afternoon in late May, we found it. I shall never forget the scene. Below us, the mountains swung down to the jungle which stretched eastward, far as the eye could see. The peaks above us had cut off the setting sun and the light had a curious violet quality. The dank, chill wind whispering and gusting set the sparse timber scrubs to trembling and shuddering and the mules, disdainful of their five strange masters, foraged the cacti and dwarf pines. The instruments were set up and the specimens were at hand, and now, crouched and tense, we leaned forward. How about it, Hess? Wait. The tube's got to warm up. Come on, come on. Wait, will you? I've waited five years for this moment. Five, five hundred, you mean? Five million? Come on, Hessie. How about it, Hess? Mm-hmm. Okay. Give him the sample, O'Brien. Yeah, here. Come on, baby. Shut up, will you? Shh. Here goes. Switch on. Holy cow. Good. Good. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Hesse. What's the word? Yeah, Hesse. Give. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Unless this machine is busted, unless this Geiger counter has forgotten its multiplication table, we have discovered the richest load of uranium ore known to man. Yeah! <laughs> I won't go into the details of how we'd come to locate the ore because that's a story in itself. Suffice it to say that late in the afternoon of that hazy May day, the five of us, gamblers all, came to the end of our rainbow, found our pot of gold. The vein runs all the way up the side of the mountain. Must be worth a million bucks. A million, a billion. A trillion bucks. <laughs> do you boys realize what we've got here? Sure we do. We've got the world at our feet. Why, the man who gets the strike registered in his name can be a king. Every country in the world is going to come running up to him with trunks full of money and power. Ah, <laughs> you tell him, Hesse. Power? Yeah, we'll make the United States the most powerful nation on earth. Why the United States? Oh, you wouldn't sell to anybody else, would you? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Harris. You're a fool. No, no. I'm a businessman. A trillion bucks. <laughs> oh, gents, we've got the world at our feet. Split five ways. <laughs> The world at our feet, 
split five ways. That night, as I lay huddled under my thin blanket, I wondered what it would be like being a wealthy man. Wondered if it were really true. Wondered how it would affect the others, how it would affect me. In the morning, we were to set off on the long return journey down to the jungle and through the jungle to the launch and down the river to civilization. There, we'd register our claim, purchase, if need be, the land, lease it perhaps from the government. <laughs> oh, millionaires, world at our feet. Uranium, enough to blow up the whole universe. Power. Harris, wake up. Uh, oh, what's, what's wake the Wake up, time? Harris, wake up. Oh, good morning, millionaire. Weems, wake up. <laughs> His son's coming up. Hey, huh? hey, where are the others? They've gone. Huh? Gone? Yes, Dumont and O'Brien. They took the mules and most of the food and cut out. When? How do I know when? Sometime during the night. But why? Why? A trillion bucks, that's why. Oh, no, no, no. Once they get down to the jungle, they'll have to travel on foot. There's ten days' march to the river. If they beat us to the boat, we're stuck with 1,500 miles of jungle between us and safety. Fifty? Impossible. We'd never make a hundred. That's right. We've got to catch them, or we're dead. We traveled as lightly as possible. It was a risky business, doubly so, because O'Brien and Dumont had taken our guns with them. The only weapons we had between us were one long machete and two pocket knives. These would be of little protection against jaguars, bushmasters, tapirs, bow constrictors, and the rest of it. Fortunately, they'd left our number one necessity to survival. They'd forgotten to take our quinine. This and our food was all we carried. The long descent to the jungle was slow going on foot. It was here that we nearly gave up hope. We moved as fast as we could, but we were no match for men who were riding. But we reached the jungle. Then things took a better turn. Here the thick vines and heavy undergrowth was, we knew, almost an impossible hazard for a riding man. And we could see their boot prints mingled with those of the mules. We knew that they were having trouble, too. The animals were afraid of many things in the jungle. Would balk suddenly require careful handling? We pushed ahead as rapidly as possible, battling mosquitoes, pume flies, matukas, and the blood-sucking carpato ticks, and, of course, the jungle itself with its never-ending barrage of razor grasses, needle vines, swamps, bog traps, and so forth. It was hot, stinking hot, and the going was hard, but we had to make it. couldn't travel at night. They'd taken our flashlights. We'd bundle up as best we could, protecting ourselves, not from the cold, it was hot and muggy even at dawn, but from the mosquitoes. And as we progressed towards the river area, from the bats, vampire bats. <laughs> Ever seen them? <laughs> They're small, rather fragile-looking little things. By day, they hang heads down from the trees, wings folded like like clusters of rotten fruit. By night, they hunt. They have razor-sharp teeth, bite like the finest steel scalpels. Their object is to break the skin very delicately, start the blood to coming, and then they simply hang on and sip. Without mosquito netting, we had a rough time of it, a sleepless time. But we managed to keep on going. And on the third day... Uh, it's not yours, fellas. We can't make it to the river before them. We've got to, Weemsy. We've got to make it. right, Weems. Even if we do catch up, they got the guns. Shh, shh, shh. Huh? What are you stopping? Oh, quiet, quiet. I heard something. What did you hear? Shh. Gunfire. Yeah. Come on. They can't be more than a mile or two ahead. Come on. We ran through the jungle, following the fresh marks of the animals uh. and the two men... And a half an hour or so later, we broke into a little clearing, and there was Dumont. Dumont. He's dead. Shot in the back. 
good old Obi. Sweet guy, that Obi. Here, come on. Let's turn him over. <laughs> He's really been sweating, huh? Uh, yeah. It's malaria. You see his face? Good old Obi. And Dumont came down with malaria, probably started to slow him down. Sweet guy, that Obi. Come on. Come on, let's go. <laughs> hey, they should have remembered the quinine. <laughs> I got no sympathy for Dumont. <laughs> You know, you know what would be nice? What? If that, if that Obi should get malaria now. Yeah, he'd be helpless. <laughs> he'd ask me for quinine. And I'd throw him a stone. On we went. Now there were no boot marks with the mule tracks. Apparently O'Brien was riding one of the animals. From time to time, we'd see a flurry of tracks churned up as though he had had to dismount to tug one of the beasts back onto the trail. We followed the tracks for another two days, and then on the sixth day, we found one of the mules. How you feeling, boy? Huh? Where's your saddle? He really looks beat. Look at those marks on his flanks. Vampire bats. Yeah. And that leaves O'Brien on foot. Yeah. Hey, hey you hear that? Hey, it's the launch. We're to the river. He's starting the motor. Come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't very far, just a few hundred yards, and the path was strewn with O'Brien's discarded supplies. Quite suddenly, we came out of the jungle and onto a narrow white sandbar, the river. And there, not 30 feet away from us, just drifting off into the deep, dark, fast-moving waters, was O'Brien and the launch. O'Brien! Look at him. He's like a skeleton. Obi! Wait for us, Obi! The launch lurched dizzily as it floated downstream. O'Brien was feeble, sweating, possessed. He had the fever, had it bad. Come on, let's go after you him. You can't. This is piranha water. Cannibal fish, they'll eat you. Yeah. Hey, Obi! Hey, you know me, Obi! Your old pal has me! Hey, what do you say, Obi? Huh? Yeah. Huh? He staggered dizzily about the cockpit, trying to start the engine. He was laughing, and he was so weak that he could barely spin the flywheel to the kicker. Obi! He slipped! Ah, good Lord, he's in the water! The fish, the piranhas! Oh, they got him, they got him! I ain't gonna look at this! One moment we saw him swimming weakly, his large, fever-ridden eyes turned imploringly toward us, and the next moment he was gone, leaving only a large, red, churning patch on the water. The piranhas are small, rarely more than 12 or 14 inches long, small fish with large, powerful jaws, teeth like broken glass, and an insatiable, maniacal appetite for flesh. The launch, caught by the deep, fast-moving waters, rocked softly this way and that, and moved on downstream, away, away around a bend and out of sight. The march of science over the years has produced better than ever gasoline for your car. But now science adds one of the greatest gasoline components of all. It's called xylene. Xylene, a super gasoline component, adds two great qualities to gasoline. Xylene gives higher than ever Antinoc performance. Xylene means power. Today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. If you want a motor that runs quiet as a whisper, if you want pickup and power to spare, try Richfield gasoline with xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers a choice of two great Richfield gasolines with xylene. Richfield high octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield ethyl. Ethyl at its best for tip-top results in the highest compression motors. Drive in where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield gasoline with xylene. Xylene, one of the highest Antinoc components in gasoline history. And now we return you to Escape, starring Vincent Price. We picked over the supplies O'Brien had left on the shore. There wasn't much we wanted. A gun without ammunition, a 
few tins of food, a tent and some bedding, cooking equipment, a coil of rope. We loaded these things onto the mule and set off through the jungle, downstream along the river's course, 1,500 miles to civilization. We had it tough. The jungle was thick along the river's bank, and we made little progress. Not more than five miles that day, but the next day, we rounded a bend, keeping close to the shore, and there, about a quarter mile below us, and nuzzling the opposite shore, grounded on the sand, lay the launch. Looks shallow enough here. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but what about the fish? How deep does it look to you, Harris, at the deepest part of me? Oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet, maybe three. Most of it's less than that. I got an idea. Shoot. We got to get across the launch, see? Yeah. So here's what we do. We throw away everything. There'll be food and water in the launch, see? Yeah. Now, you see that little patch of sand in the middle of the river where the bar shows? Yeah. We go that way. That's bound to be the shallowest way, see? How do we go? On the mule, the three of us. Ah, you nuts. This mule ain't in such bad condition it can't get the three of us across 70 feet of shallow water. What do you say, Harris? Why not? All right, I'll get aboard first. Come on. Get farther up, Weemsy. You're the lightest. Yeah. Harris, you get on next. Mm -hmm. Hang on to Weemsy. Yeah. Here, here. Carry this coil of rope around your neck. We may okay. need it. I've got the machete strapped to my back. Hey, you set, Weems? Yeah. <clears throat> now hold tight to me, Hess. Don't worry. If I go, you go too. Yeah. And if he goes, I go. <laughs> so let's hang on, gents. Yeah. Let's really hang on. As long as he's moving fast, he can't get at his legs. Ain't that right? He's not showing anything to him but hoofs and hair. Hold his head up, Weems. Don't let him look down. Uh, now, you all set? Yeah, all set. All right, here we go. All right, get off. Come on, come on. Come on, baby. I felt the mule uh, lurch when he baby. stepped into the Put water. The sand was on, softer here than on the shore. Sand, huh? Ahead, Come not on, 40 feet away, lay the Come little on. spit of land. The mule refused to Come. run, couldn't run, and before he'd taken 10 steps, I knew he was too weak to support the three of us. Hey. From every direction in the swirling water about us came small, shadowy, dark shapes. Come on. The piranhas. Don't stop! Come on, baby. Come on. Keep uh, moving, baby. Come uh, on. Move along, baby. He can't do it. You gotta do it, baby. Come on. Sweet Come on. mother... What are those? The piranhas were churning the water about us, and coming in from beyond them were four or five long, dark shapes, six and seven feet long, thick and wriggling. Eels, electric eels. Uh, they'll sting them. Get along. To the bar. Get him to the sandbar. Faster, faster. Come on. Uh, made it. It's true about electric eels. <sighs> I can throw a jolt that'll kill a jaguar. Make a jaws like a vice. So, here we are, gentlemen, stuck. Just 30 feet of water between us and the shore. Get across it, and we can get to the launch and the civilization and all the rest oh, of it. The three of us are too much for that mule. Uh, only 30 feet. Why, you could run it in seconds. You see those little shadows around us in the water? I see those little shadows around us. You don't have to draw pictures. Hey, Oh, here's another bright idea coming up. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, hold on to your hat, Harris. We got that curl of rope. Yes. The mule could carry one of us. That mule's not in such bad shape, you know. Yes. Tie the rope over his bridle. Then one of us pulls him over with him fast, you see. One rides, and then the other two pull him back. Yeah. And yeah. the next one gets on. Yeah. What do you say? Oh, he can't stay here. It's a natural. Who uh, goes first? Me, on account I'm the lightest. I won't tire him so much. How about it, Harris? All right. Well, get going, then. Okay. Tie that rope to his bridle. I'm doing it. All right, give me the machete. What do you want the machete for? I want it, that's all. Give me. No. Okay. All right, Here. now you two get at the end of the spit. So as when you pay out the line, you don't get it caught in his legs. Well, you think of everything. That's right. I'm a smart boy. You're ready with the line. You sure it's tied fast to the bridle? Yeah, I'm sure. No funny business, Weems. All we gotta do is jerk this rope once while you're over that water and you're done for. You're a sharp article. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But not sharp enough! Hey! Weems! You cut the rope! So long, suckers! The rope. Our only salvation was cut. And now Weems, grinning and riding, was out into the stream, heading for the shore and safe. <laughs> He went not 15 feet when one of the long, dark, wriggling shapes made for the mule and got his leg. The mule reared up on his hind legs, the eel clinging to his foot, pumping paralyzing shocks into him. 
Weems clutched his neck with one hand and slapped him on the flank with the flat of the machete with the other. The mule came down and more eels went for his legs. He began to lurch sideways. Weems swung the long steel blade in an arc, barely missing the mule's leg, and connected with one of the eels. His hair seemed to stand on end. His other arm released the mule's neck. The arm holding the blade was extended stiffly, still caught in the thick, muscular back of the electric eel. And then the mule reared again, and Weems fell back into the water. The mule, freed of Weems, made the shore and vanished into the jungle. We turned away. No man could watch what was happening to Weems and retain his sanity. And so, there we were. Hess and I on that sand spit which the river was slowly washing away. Night coming, vampire bats coming, and all about us, the electric eels and the little cannibal fish waiting. There was no moon. There were evil stars, red and yellow. It was a black sky, and against it, blacker shapes, the vampire bats. We waved our arms and kept them off, but again and again, during that long and terrible night, they brushed against us, squealing and squeaking, trying to get us. Dark, evil, thirsting bats. A thousand years later came the dawn. That water's taken a lot of sand away. This thing isn't much bigger than a card table. Mm. Look at them. Look at those fish. You think they had enough to eat yesterday? Mm. Mm. Listen, Harris. No matter what happens now, at least you and I have played it square, right? Yeah, that's right, Harris. Yes. Shake my hand, Harris. All right. Because I think I got an idea on how we can get out of here. What? Yeah. Look up there. Yeah. See see that vine hanging down from the big tree? It's over the water, and it must be 15 feet up. Yeah, yeah, but if you were on it, you could do a tars into the shore. The rope? That's right. Now, if we can just lasso the end of that and pull tight, we'll have enough swing to make it across. Swing like a pendulum, if you follow me. One guy gets on the other's shoulders to swing over to get the start, see? Then when he gets to shore, he fastens a rock and swings the rope back to the other. Oh, that vine will hold. It'll work. <laughs> It took us two hours before we managed to lasso the end of that vine. And then we tested it again and again until we were positive it would hold a man's weight. And then we were ready. Uh, you stand good and steady now, pal. I'm going to go easy on you, but don't shake. Because if you spill me in that water, I'm a gone guy. I'm ready. <clears throat> I'm ready. Good luck. Uh, here. No! I felt his feet leave my shoulders, and then he was off, skimming the water with his feet drawn up, and then, miraculously, he was on the shore. Good boy! <laughs> good boy! <laughs> yeah! Like a breeze, huh? <laughs> like a breeze. Hey, uh, any rocks around there? Sorry. He smiled at me and shrugged and then looked down the stream at the launch. I knew that smile, that trillion-dollar smile. It said, so long, sucker. <laughs> Don't do it, Hess. Send me the rope. <laughs> You're too nice a guy, Harris. You and I would never get along. You, you can have it all, Hess, every scrap of it. Only for the love of mercy, send me the rope. No, no, you'd want some. You wouldn't approve of what I mean to do with it. Hess! <laughs> He's stood there laughing at me and shaking his head slowly. But uh, above him, just over his head, was another vine, thick and mottled, and it was moving. Look out, Hess! Hess! But he didn't understand or didn't hear me. Just stood there smiling and shaking his head. The boa constrictor dropped heavily and accurately a thrashing tangle of scaly musk. <laughs> The sun was hot, blistering hot. 
I was alone, all alone, except for the ever-waiting piranhas. Hess's body was hidden by the low, scrubby vines and palmettos. Several hours later, I saw the boa, now gorged, slither lumpily away. I waited, and I waited. From time to time, I thought of stepping out into the stream. It would be over very quickly, I told myself, very quickly. But I, I couldn't. And then I noticed an odd thing. The current which had been sweeping the sand away had shifted slightly. A whim, a miracle. And now new sand from some sunken bar was beginning to pile up between me and the shore, grain by grain, rib by rib. I watched this. And I watched. And I watched. And at five o'clock that afternoon, I walked ashore to the lawn. And didn't even get my feet wet. It's nice where I live. Quiet little streets, nice people, nice kids, nice country. Peaceful, nice peace. I know where there's enough uranium to blow it all to hell. Want it? <laughs> Just go up the river. <laughs> up the river, it's, uh, it's for the taking. Ask Dumont and Obi and Weems and Hess. A trillion bucks worth. Enough to give the whole world a bloodbath. Yourself included. <laughs> Warm summer weather makes you think of baseball games, picnics, and holiday driving. But be sure your car's ready when you are. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service, the service that puts your car in top shape for warm weather driving. With Richfield All Point Safety Service, you get a careful All Point lubrication job that protects the chassis, transmission, and differential. You get lubricants that stick to your car's ribs no matter what the temperature. You get the protection of Rich Lube, all-weather motor oil, the Pennsylvania premium-grade oil that cleans as it lubricates. You also get a safety check of batteries, spark plugs, tires, and radiator, and expert service if your car has automatic transmission. The Richfield gasoline dealer is specially trained to protect your car against wear and breakdown. So get Richfield all-point safety service tomorrow. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight starred Mr. Vincent Price. Bloodbath was written by James Poe. Others in the cast were Wally Mayer, Ted DeCorsia, Paul Fries, and Tony Barrett. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea, moving carefully, step by step, dreading to find what you know is there. Death in the form of a deadly Bushmaster from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape to the Caribbean and a grim voyage of impending death as Martin Storm tells it in his exciting tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>